Okay, we're here today on realagriculture.com at the Tiffin Conference in Lethbridge. We're here right now with Dr. Joe Schwartz. He is from McGill University out of Montreal. Welcome today, Dr. Schwartz. Thanks very much. Okay, Dr. Schwartz, talk a little bit about uh, your area of focus. Well, my area is really disseminating proper scientific information and demystifying science for the public. Uh, that's the mandate of the office that I direct at McGill. And uh, we deal with all kinds of issues. We deal with medications, we deal with cosmetics, we deal with environmental concerns, and of course we deal with food. Because that's one thing that humanity has in common. There are not many things that we all have in common, but we all eat. And we're all concerned about what we eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's face it, it, it's realistic that we should be, because food is the only raw material that ever enters our body. So everything that happens inside of our body, from the very construction of our tissues to all the chemical reactions that constitute life, has to somehow be related to what we eat. So of course there's a great deal of interest out there and there's a great deal of controversy and confusion too. Because one day we're told, go out there and eat as many fish as you can because of the omega-3 fats, the next day we find out, well, there's PCBs and mercuries in the fish, so you better you know, hang tight about that one. Uh, virtually every day brings some new bit of information. And we're living in the age of information, it's information overload. Uh, people don't know who to trust. Sometimes the quacks sound very, very trustworthy. They speak well, but they speak nonsense. So uh, you know, my, my uh, efforts are directed at uh, getting the proper science out there, making sure that people are making decisions based on data and evidence and not on hearsay and on emotion. Unfortunately, emotion will always trump science in the, in the public forum. So it's a tough battle. Mm -hmm. um, we can win the odd battle, I don't think we can win the war against scientific illiteracy. Yeah. So what role do you see science playing in the, uh, in the food system in the future? Is, is science going to take a, a more key role? Or is oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, we are already seeing some of the benefits of genetic modification. I think we will see a great deal more in the future. Uh, it's a technology that's only you know, a quarter of a century old at, at, at most. Um, which is, of course, nothing but a spit in time. But what we have seen with genetic modification is a demonstration of principle. We've seen that, that it can be done. And uh, it's the same kind of idea as, as demonstrating flying, you know. The, the first time that the Wright brothers flew in 1904 was not a very impressive thing, right? They bounded along for a couple hundred meters. But anybody who was there quickly recognized that this was an important moment because they had shown that this can be done. And it didn't take much imagination to realize that, well, maybe next year they'll be flying 500 meters and the year after that, a couple of kilometers. This is where we stand. We, we've seen the principle of genetic modification and where it's going to go is, is, is very exciting. Mm -hmm. It's true that, I mean, so far it has not had a huge impact. Uh, it has certainly had some. I mean, there's no, no question that, that farmers have benefited uh, from it. But the general public hasn't, or I mean not directly, they benefited in the sense that some foods may have become cheaper because of uh, genetic modification. But uh, you know, the, the public worries about it, they don't know what genes are, they don't want genes fooled around with. And uh, because they have not seen any direct benefit, of course they tend to look askew at this technology. I mean, I, I've always said that if uh, 15 years ago, when the first genetically modified food, which at that time was the flavor saver tomato, was introduced, if that had been a success, I don't think we'd be looking at any problems today with genetic modification, because that would have clearly demonstrated a plus. You know, if you could have bought a tomato in January, which tasted like one that you picked off you know, your vine in the summer, that would have sold the technology. Unfortunately, it didn't work, it didn't taste very good. And you know, when, when the consumer doesn't have something direct to relate to, then you know, they, they, they're uh, very, very uh, susceptible to all of the negative publicity. Because then, you know, why should they care about any pluses when they don't see any pluses, you know, when they hear all of the negative? So you've mentioned uh, GM foods or you know, GM technology, you've mentioned labeling. What do you, what do you think, uh, there's a lot of uh, pressure in, from some groups that we need to be labeling those yes. sorts of foods. Well, when you label, the reason to label something is to provide information. 
So you always have to ask the question of, of what is the consumer going to take away from that label? For example, if we have canola oil, which is pressed from seeds that uh, came from genetically modified plants, <clears throat> but that final oil has no vestige of the genetic modification, there's no chemical way to tell the difference between that oil or any other oil. Why would you then want to label that oil as coming from a genetic modified crop when it has nothing to do with the final product? What matters is what that final product is, not the path that was taken to get there. In the same way, I mean, why do we not care whether or not that broccoli that we buy is labeled with the specific pesticides or fertilizers that have been used? Because it's irrelevant, right? Uh, the only argument against that uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the genetic modified area is people say, well, uh, I'm ethically opposed to genetic modification. I don't say that it's, it's dangerous, uh, but I don't want to support that industry. So if I want to buy canola oil that's not from GMO plants, I want to know that. Now that's, that's not an unreasonable argument. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I can swallow that when, when they preface it with remarks saying that it, you know, it's not because they're worried about health consequences or anything. They're worried about uh, uh, cultural uh, effects, maybe even environmental concerns, you know, pollen drift or whatever. That's, that's a personal choice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you don't want to support that technology, maybe you should have the right. So I, I'm not against labeling. Uh, in fact, uh, I was a big proponent of labeling the very first time that, that genetic modified products were introduced. I think they missed the boat on that one with, with the, the uh, advocacy against labeling mm. because that demonstrated that there was some concern. Why not label it? You know, why not, in fact, say enhanced by genetic modification? There's nothing to hide here. Right. You know? And as, as, soon as, as soon as you create the impression that, that you don't want to label, what does that mean? It means you're trying to hide something. There's nothing to hide. Label it. Right. Yeah. So uh, finally, what do you think is going to be one of the biggest changes in the, in the food system in the next 50 years? Do you see anything that's... Uh, the biggest challenge that we have is feeding the world. I mean, we sit here in Canada in the comfort, you know, of our warm rooms, eating as much as we want, debating whether or not we should eat genetically modified crops, whereas a third of the world is starving. Mm -hmm. This is where the biggest changes are going to have to come. We have to find ways to, to, to curb the hunger uh, in the world. Um, exactly how that's going to happen, it's hard to say. It's going to, to take another kind of green revolution. I think genetic modification is going to play a, an important uh, uh, role in there. But, uh, you know, it's very hard for us to say now to the developing world is, you know, gee, you know, I mean, we've been enjoying eating all of this meat, which is, of course, a very environmentally unfriendly product, but you can't have that now, you know. So those are the kind of challenges that we're going to have to, to meet. We will learn also a great deal more about nutrition. Uh, I mean, certainly um, the way we eat today is quite different from the way we ate 50 years ago because nutritional science has contributed a great deal. We know a lot about antioxidants. The term didn't exist 50 years ago. Uh, so I think we'll be able to give better guidelines on just what the ideal diet should be, what the composition of the diet uh, should be. So uh, uh, yeah, I mean, science is going to play a, a big role and it's going to contribute, I think, to, to uh, increase longevity uh, just by eating the right things. And um, again, we, you know, we get back to, to tinkering around with the genes. Uh, where we will really start to see the benefits is when you start inserting genes into food that, that code for nutrients that are beneficial. For example, kids, uh, very hard to convince them to eat broccoli, even though we know that it contains an anti-cancer compound, sulforaphane. But if you can take that gene that codes for that and put it into a potato, well, you can convince the kid to eat the potato. You know, so we're going to see a lot of advances in, in food technology. Well, Dr. Schwartz, thank you very much for joining us today. It was very interesting. Thank, thank you. you.